Bible says ask. You know, there might be a lot of things that I knew my kids needed and I don't know, I might not be moved to do it or motivated to do it. But you know what? It changes the whole structure of things when they come and ask. <laughs> it's amazing how much people get by just asking. Now, one of the things I do believe, and I've been thinking about this quite a bit this morning, but I want you to look at this in the context of asking God for things, but also being bolder with people. You know, there are some people who probably deserve a raise, and you could probably get one if you'd go ask for one, but you're afraid if you go ask, you might lose your job. Or you're afraid you'll make your boss mad. Or there might be some of you that are being overworked and, and underpaid, and maybe they're making you work so much you can't even pay proper attention to your family anymore, and you need to go and just confront the situation, but you're afraid you might lose your job. Afraid, 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 afraid. You know, it's usually the people who ask that get. But here's the other side of it. I don't think that you should start being bolder and asking more aggressively unless you're able to handle no. And see, this is one of the main reasons why we don't ask is because we're not able to handle no. If we're not told yes, then we get offended, we get our feelings hurt, we start to feel insecure and unloved, and it embarrasses us. And there's no need for that. You know, I have certain people that work for me that would never ask for anything. And then I have other people that just ask for stuff all the time. And to be honest, sometimes they ask for things that is more like presumption and it's something that they really shouldn't have even asked for. But you know what? The couple in particular that I'm thinking about, they don't get offended when you tell them no. And I'd much rather deal with somebody like that than somebody who acts like they're petrified to ask me anything all the time. If I don't like it when people act like they're afraid of me, then I know for sure God doesn't like it if people act like they're afraid of Him. Is anybody understanding what I'm saying today? If you, you know, if, if you go and you ask somebody for something and it's kind of an out there thing, you know, you're kind of on the edge asking and they say, you know what, I just can't do that, then say, okay, I understand. Don't go away and get wounded and offended. We have to give each other freedom. You're free to ask if I'm free to answer you according to what I believe God's speaking to me. But I don't want you asking if the only way you're going to stay together is if I tell you yes about everything. And that's the problem that we get into. You know, it's like, you know, anybody that wants to hear yes and you tell them no, they're not going to be happy. But we need to realize that there's going to be times when we hear yes, there's going to be times when we hear no, we're going to, there's going to be times we're going to say right now, or not right now, or times when we say I have to think about it. And I love to deal with people like that. I mean, I absolutely love to deal with people that are more, more bold and aggressive, not rude and obnoxious, but bold and aggressive, but at the same time, they're not wearing all their feelings on their sleeve and they get offended every time they don't get what they want. You know what I think? I think there's a whole bunch of stuff in our lives that we just need to get over it. Just get over it. If somebody tells you no, don't make more out of it than what it is. You know, it is what it is. You asked, they said no. Now don't, you know, don't make this big ordeal out of it. Just go on about your business. Don't be afraid to ask somebody the next time. Some of you need a, you need a turning today. You need a turning in the spirit. You need to come out of that, that timid, shy, weak, wimpy attitude. And you need to say, I know who I am in Christ. I know what I'm not in myself, but I also know what I am and who I am in him. God loves me. He sent his only son to die for me. I've been made right with him through the blood of Christ. And the Bible tells me all over the place to come boldly to the throne. And that I have free access and I can come with a bold approach and ask God for things. Amen. Amen. Go to John 14. Now, you know, some of you are right here with me and you're like, yeah, 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 preach it, sister. But you know what? There are people here today, you ain't never heard nothing like this. And it's like, I don't know about that. 
Well, I felt the exact same way years ago when I started learning about these kind of things. But I tell you, this is the stuff that's changed my life. And if I wouldn't have learned what I'm telling you today, I would not be where I'm at today. I'll say it again. You have not because you ask not. You have not because you ask not. You have not because you ask not. And you cannot ask in fear. You have to ask in faith. Did you hear me? You cannot ask in fear. You have to ask in faith. And we need to live expecting good things to happen in our life. We need to expect the favor of God. We need to expect breakthrough. We need to expect blessings instead of expecting trouble all the time. Well, I'm having a good time up here. John 14, verse 12. Now, this will be eye-opening if you've never seen this. And you probably haven't if you don't usually read an Amplified Bible. John 14, verse 12, 13, and 14. I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, if anyone steadfastly believes in me, he will himself be able to do the things that I do, and he will do even greater things than these because I go to the Father. And I will do, I myself will grant whatever you ask in my name. Now listen, what the Amplified says. As presenting all that I am, so that the Father may be glorified and extolled in and through the Son. Yes, I will grant, I myself will do for you whatever you shall ask in my name. He says the same thing two times in a row. Now, he didn't forget he already said it once. He's repeating it for a reason. I will give you whatever you ask for if when you come and you speak my name, you understand that you're not before my throne presenting to me what you are, but you're presenting to me what Jesus is. You know what? People that work for me get action when they go and say, Joyce told me to tell you. They might go five times in their own name and nobody pays attention to them. But if they go and they say, Joyce told me to tell you, man, it gets done right away. Now, that's the little bit of authority that I have, but God has all authority on heaven and in earth and under the earth. And Jesus has been given the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus. See, Jesus is not a little lucky charm we tack onto the end of all of our prayers. Jesus name. Jesus name. Jesus name. <laughs> no, he said, I got to go away, but I'll tell you what I'll give you. I'll give you my name. <laughs> I'll give you my name. And his name represents him. When we go before the throne and we say, Father, I come in Jesus' name. Now, right now, God is no longer seeing me, but he's seeing his son and remembering the sacrifice that he made for me. And the Bible says, if I just believe in him, if I just believe in him, that even though I make mistakes and I do silly things, that if I really, truly, consistently, genuinely believe in him, that I can do even greater things than he did. And whatever I need, I can ask for it. And if I ask in his name... See, it's so important that just the understanding of the power that's in the name of Jesus and what you're doing when you speak that name is brought to the forefront in your thinking sometimes because it does just become kind of a habit that doesn't mean anything to us. And if you were here last night, you know, I ministered some healing and prayed for, prayed for people in a lot of different areas and every once in a while I would stop and everybody would just say, Jesus. And I don't know if you sense what I sense, but I sense it all the time in our meetings. When everybody says, 
Jesus, it's like, almost like the anointing is just raining. I don't go to God in Joyce's name. I don't go in Dave's name. The Bible never tells you to go in your own name. Matter of fact, you better not go in your own name. You don't even ask boldly because you deserve. You ask boldly because Jesus earned everything and he's given it all to you. He is an heir and we are joint heirs with him. That's why your kids can get more from you than anybody else can. About being stable. Stable. Dependable. Reliable. Not up and down in your moods and your commitments, but stable. Not letting your circumstances dictate how you feel and what you do, but remaining stable, building your life on the rock, which is the Word of God, which is Christ Himself. I think that we want to be stable first and foremost to honor God. We want God to be able to depend on us. But I also believe that there's some other things connected to stability that we may not understand. For example, I believe that many people have a lot of ability wonderful gifts and talents and abilities. They have dreams and visions. They see themselves doing things. They believe they're called to do things. And yet God cannot release them. Now listen to me. God cannot release that ability because they don't have stability. The more stable we are, the more God can release us to use the abilities that he has placed in us. You see, when I started in ministry 30 some odd years ago, for five years I taught a home Bible study that was about 25 or maybe 30 people on a good Tuesday night. And I had a call on my life to do what I'm doing now, but God could not release me then to use the full potential of that ability because I didn't have the spiritual maturity to go along with it. And you have to understand that However many people you can help, that's exactly how many you can hurt. It's very important to people that we lead, that we live the life we say that we represent. It's very important as parents that you're stable in front of your children. They don't need to see you being, not being truthful in what you say and do. Kids see stuff. If they see you making a commitment and then not keeping it, if they hear you picking up the telephone and telling, or telling somebody when you answer the phone, tell them I'm not here, they hear that, they see that. They know when you're acting emotionally and being radical. And it's not that we have to be perfect in front of our children all the time. Goodness sakes, you know, we all have feelings and emotions and sometimes we're gonna act on them. But we need to get better and better and better all the time at managing our emotions instead of letting them manage us. Not only for the people around us, not only so our gifts can be released, but also for our own joy. I don't have joy if I can't depend on myself. I remember those days when I never knew from one day to the next what I was gonna be like. And I didn't like that because my circumstances dictated everything and it was a miserable way to live. And it's miserable for the people trying to live with you and being in relationship with you. My father was a very volatile man, very moody, and you never knew from one minute to the next what he was gonna do. And all I ever remember growing up was fear. My mother lived in fear. And I'm so glad that I am married to a stable man. Of all the things that Dave has brought into my life, he has taught me the value of stability. I mean, the man is really just like a rock. I remember when I was so volatile back in those days, in the early days of our marriage, and Dave said, after I had changed quite a bit, he said, I remember when I used to come home from work at night. You know, this is sad. He said, I remember driving down the highway at night thinking, well, I wonder what she'll be like tonight when I get home. <laughs> you know, that's not very much fun to live with somebody like that. The first thing you must stop doing is making excuses. Well, I can't help it. I'm just an emotional person. Well, if you had to put up with what I put up with, you'd throw a few tantrums too. Well, I can't help it. I just can't control myself. 
First of all, God's never going to tell us to do something that we can't do. But I don't think we're going to do anything if we don't realize how important it is. Does anybody really realize how important it is that we become stable individuals? Do you get it? Amen. So many people say that they want to be promoted, but you know, every new level, you're going to face a new devil. And if you don't know how to be stable as you're tested and tried, then even if God promoted you, he'd have to demote you the next week because we prove quickly that we don't have what it takes to be where we're at. God requires those who serve him to be careful. Careful about what you do. Careful about what you say. Stable. Dependable. Reliable. Not easily shaken. And in control of their emotions. Now, we're in a war, so to speak. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So we know that we're in a war. It's a spiritual war. We have an enemy. His name is Satan. And he comes against us in many, many, many different ways. I just did a series called The Strategies of Satan where I talked about how he's the deceiver. He comes against our minds. He's the destroyer. He brings circumstances into our life hoping to destroy our faith. He's a ruler and a controller. He wants us to become passive in decision making so he's manipulating us rather than us using our will to make decisions according to the word of God. And he's the accuser of the brethren. He will tempt you to do a wrong thing and then accuse you for doing it. Amen. So we definitely have an enemy and he's going to fight, 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 fight. But we're fighting from a place of victory. We're not trying to get victory. We actually already have victory. The greater one lives in us. We're more than conquerors. We have been delivered out of the kingdom of darkness, transferred into the kingdom of light. We're not trying to get these things. We have them now. But it is important that we discipline ourselves to live a stable lifestyle and to manage our emotions. Just like we need to control our mouth. Can somebody say amen? amen? Just like we need to control our mind. Can somebody say amen? amen? We also need to control our emotions. Can everybody say amen? amen? You know that you can get up and think you're going to have a great day. And if you're not emotionally stable, something can happen that sets you off. And all of a sudden now, that day that was going to be great at 8 a.m. by 9 a.m. is totally ruined. And the rest of the day, you're in an emotional frenzy all day long. But it does not have to be that way. In 1 Chronicles 12, 33, when David was going to war, he asked for 50,000 men from different troops. But when he sent his leaders out together, those men, he said, 50,000 men that are trustworthy, reliable, and stable. Well, I'd personally like to know how he found 50,000 men. I don't know that you could find 50,000 today. But apparently that was something that people paid a lot more attention to back then than we do today. A lot of the values that we see in the Bible, we don't pay enough attention to. It's important to keep commitments. You don't make them emotionally and then break them emotionally. You know that your word is your honor. And if you say that you're going to do something, then you need to do it. It's important that we're not just led around by our emotions, buying things emotionally, saying things emotionally, making emotional commitments, and then emotionally breaking those commitments. We're in a war. And the only people that are going to win the war are the ones that are stable. Proverbs 25, 28 is a wonderful scripture. We're going to put it up here on the screen for you. He who has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Now, you know, in the Old Testament, every city had walls around it because those walls were their protection. And if those walls were broken down, then they were open to the enemy. Well, really, truly, what this is saying is if you're not ruling your own emotions, if you're not 
taking care of your thoughts and taking care of your words, if you have no rule over yourself and you're just doing whatever, whenever, whatever you feel like, then you are like a city that's broken down and has no walls around it. What does that mean? You're wide open to the enemy. We could avoid a lot of the trouble that we have with Satan. I said we could avoid a lot of the trouble that we have with Satan if we would just simply get these emotions under control and stop letting them rule us. Why do we think that because we feel a certain way, we have to act that way? We don't have to act that way. I remember when I used to have tantrums with my kids and I would get so upset because they messed the house up or whatever and really I was the one that was messed up and I was just frustrated, but every little thing that would set me off, then I'd go into a I know, I know none of you act like that, but maybe there's one person watching by TV that needs to hear this today. And then I would have my crying spells and feel sorry for myself after I'd rant and rave and scream at my kids and now they were all crying and hurt and, oh God, I'm so sorry, I just can't help it. I just don't know what's wrong with me, God. I just lose my temper and I can't help it. And you know, God taught me that I could help it if I wanted to. Now, you know the example he gave me? He said, if your pastor showed up at the front door right now, you'd get over this and you'd get over it in a flat second. By the time you got to the front door, you'd be a totally different person. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Glory. And I tell people all the time, you know, if you were in one of your fits at home behind closed doors and I showed up, you'd change in a big hurry. So we can control ourselves. And until we believe that, nothing's going to change. I said we can control ourselves. I said we can control ourselves. And until we believe that, nothing's going to change. Why do we think that we should control ourselves in front of somebody we're trying to impress, but at home behind closed doors with the people we should be the best to and build the best relationships with, we act like a totally different person? Because we think those people just have to put up with us. You need to honor your families. You need to honor those people that you're committed to. Philippians 1.28, do not for a moment, not for one moment, be frightened or intimidated in anything by your opponents and adversaries. For such constancy, that means stability, and fearlessness will be a clear sign, proof, and a seal to them, your enemies, of their impending destruction, but a sure token and evidence of your deliverance and salvation and that from God. So there's two different forces watching us. The devil's watching, God's watching. And when a circumstance comes our way, we have a choice to make. We can get all upset or we can stay peaceful. Both sides are watching. This scripture is saying that if we remain peaceful, the devil knows that his days are just about over. See, he sets you up to get you upset, but if he can't upset you, then he'll go bother somebody that he can't upset. So the enemy's watching, and when you are constant and fearless, it's a clear sign to him of his impending destruction, but it also says to God, says to God that you are trusting him. No matter how much we say we trust God, if we're all upset all the time, then really we're not trusting God. But when he sees that we are trusting him, then that's a clear sign to him that it's time for our deliverance. Now let's look at verse 29, Philippians 1, 29. For you have been granted the privilege for Christ's sake, not only to believe in, adhere to, rely on, and trust in him, but also to suffer in his behalf. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, Sister Joyce. No, I don't want to talk about that suffering word. <laughs> A lot of times I just read Philippians 1.28 when I share this and Dave will tell me every time afterwards, you should have read verse 29 too. So I don't want to get a speech when I'm done today. So I'm reading verse 29. And here's the point. If you remain stable, here, I mean this is just the truth. If you remain stable, while you're waiting for your deliverance, you are going to have a suffering in your flesh. 
because there's a part of us that just wants to do something. We want to say something. We want to have this little emotional tantrum. We want people to know that we're just not going to put up with this. And here's the thing, as long as you're trying to take care of yourself, God will just stand back and say, let me know when you're done. But if we can remain peaceful and say, God, we believe you're working right now. Even though we don't see a change yet, we believe you're working. You have the privilege not only to believe in Christ, but also to endure a little bit of suffering while you're waiting for his deliverance because it's those hard times in our life that make us grow spiritually. Every day that you stay firm and steadfast and you don't have your breakthrough, you're growing spiritually on that day. Amen? Now I know all we ever want is our breakthrough, but honestly I'm telling you, you get your growth in the hard times, not the good times. In the good times you enjoy the growth you got in the hard times. There are positive and negative emotions. The word emotion means to excite, to stir up, and to move out. So literally, you can feel your emotions rising up and starting to go in a direction. <laughs> and what they want you to do is trot along behind them <laughs> and just do whatever they say. You can learn to recognize those feelings, and when they begin to rise up, you can literally say no and push them right back down. That doesn't mean you're not going to feel them, but it does mean that you don't have to follow them. Does anybody believe what I'm saying today? Yeah. Anger is one of the strongest negative emotions. I think we all agree with that. Anger is a very strong negative emotion. And you may have 50 opportunities every week to be offended, to get angry. But you don't have to stay that way. You can take an offense or you don't have to take it. Excitement is one of the positive emotions. We all like to be excited. It's not bad to be excited, but I want to share something with you today that maybe you've never thought of. Extreme excitement, excitement that is not also disciplined, can push you over into an area where now you begin to make decisions out of that excitement that can cause you a lot of problems later on. Because if we make decisions just out of excitement, what are we going to do when we're not excited anymore? because you won't maintain that level of excitement. Now I know this, I believe this, I try to live by this, but about two weeks ago, I got excited about something and I let myself get too excited and I started making decisions that were not good common sense. And it was actually the thing I was doing was a good thing and it was a God thing. I was trying to help somebody. I like to help people. And I don't say that bragging because I spent a lot of years not wanting to help anybody but me. So God has definitely changed me. And I can say that I probably get one of my greatest joys is in helping people. I just enjoy it. I enjoy it. I get excited when I can make somebody happy. I get excited when I can put a smile on somebody's face. I love to make things happen for people that they want, that maybe there's no way that they could have that thing if somebody didn't come along beside of them. I love to let God make people happy through me. And I know many of you love that too. It's a great thing. So I love to help people. And this person that I was trying to help was somebody that I really love anyway. It was one of my kids. And so I really, it really ramped it up to another level. And so I got all on board and I got excited about helping her and I mean we were spending all of our time trying to work this thing out and make it happen. Bottom line, long story short is, I wasn't getting the rest I needed. I ran at such a high emotional level for so many days that then I ended up feeling like my accelerator was pressed to the floor and when I'd lay down at night to sleep, I couldn't sleep. So then I went several nights where I was getting five and six hours sleep and that just does not work for me. I mean, I learned about four or five years ago as I began to get a few years older in age, I'm not older in heart, but I get older in age. I'm not old, but I'm adding years to my life. And I realized that I had to do things differently if I was gonna be able to do what I'm doing. 
Because when I work, I work very hard. God gives me the grace to do that. I believe that God covers us when what we're doing is something that's in His will. But I don't believe He covers us if we're just being foolish. So I know, I know from God. God has given me a plan for my health and my life. I know I need to work out. I know I need to eat right. I know that I need to drink lots of water. I know I need to get plenty of rest. And I know that I need to stay balanced by working and also having some fun. And I know that every time I don't do that, I open a door for the devil. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, be well balanced for your adversary the devil roams about like a lion roaring in fierce hunger seeking someone to seize upon and devour. So when we're just out of balance, we open a door for the enemy. See, the point is, is even if you're doing a good thing, if you're doing it emotionally, you can still get yourself in trouble. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? So it's not only just the low emotions that can get us in trouble, but it's also uncontrolled high emotions that can get us in trouble. Well, Peter was a man that was easily shaken, and yet God ended up using Peter in a mighty way. So the good news is, hallelujah, we can change. Isn't that good news? So even if you're a person that's given to a lot of emotion, if you're given to a lot of ups and downs, you've got a lot of bad habits in that area, you've let your emotions rule, you've let your emotions control you, today is a day of decision making. Today is when you set your mind, I don't care how long it takes, I am going to be a stable, dependable, reliable, committed person. I am not going to let my emotions manage me. I'm going to manage them. Let's look at Matthew 16, beginning in verse 13. Now when Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Then Jesus answered him, blessed, happy, fortunate, and envied are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood, men have not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. At that moment, Peter was speaking out of a heart revelation that God had given him. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. I believe that you are who you say that you are. Now let's put that next scripture back up. And I tell you, you are Peter. Greek Petros, a large piece of rock. And on this rock, Greek Petra, a huge rock like Gibraltar, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now Jesus is the rock, and as believers in him, we become pieces of the rock. And there's such a message here because he said, now Peter, this thing that's been revealed to you of who I am, if you maintain that, you put your trust in me, then obviously he would be like a rock. He wouldn't be easily moved. He wouldn't be easily shaken. Because when we really believe in God and we believe he's on our side and we believe that he can do all things and we believe that he loves us, if we just believe the word of God, no matter what circumstance comes against us, we can stay like a rock because we know that God is in charge. But just like Peter, we can agree with that in church and clap 